I've always dreaded Mondays, but this one turned out to be particularly awful. My wife, Peggy, was in a deep funk and quite moody. She prepared breakfast for the boys and me in a mechanical manner. She wasn't angry, just clearly depressed, which only added to the gloom of the morning. I didn't know what was bothering her and had no inclination to ask. My sons, Robert, 16, and Dave, 18, left for school around the same time I headed to work. For the last 15 years, I've been employed at a shipping company, dealing with loading and unloading container ships. It was tough work but well compensated. I had always dreamed of being out at sea, and this job was the closest I could get. I longed to sail around the world and explore new places and cultures. It was a deep-seated desire, and sometimes it made me feel down to think it would never happen. Nevertheless, home and family held more significance to me. I was happy with my family life, having two wonderful sons and a loving wife I cherished. What I disliked most about my job were certain colleagues, especially Colin Farrell. He was unbearable and always surrounded by his sidekicks, Bob Timbers, Ray Collins, and Freddie Springer. We all went to high school together, and I never liked them back then, nor now. Hey, Grady, I missed you at the party on Saturday night, Colin said, seemingly itching for a confrontation. There was a corporate party that evening but the boys and I had to travel to Chester to help my dad move. After my mom passed away six months ago, dad decided to downsize. Peggy was disappointed, so I suggested she attend the party without us. When we got back on Sunday night, I asked her about the party, and she merely replied, fine. I didn't respond to Colin's comment. We missed you there, Grady, but we appreciate you letting your wife come, he continued causing me to clench my fists as I listened to his group laugh mockingly. I tried to walk away, but Colin followed and kept taunting. She's really grown into a looker since high school, Grady. You're lucky to have such a catch to come home to every night. I knew it was going to be a long day. My forehead veins started to throb, and the muscles in my neck tightened. I've always had to struggle with my temper. As I tried to leave again, Colin threw something at me, a pair of red tank tops. Peggy left these on Saturday, she might need them. The group erupted until after. I stared at the tank tops on the concrete loading dock without moving. I realized I had stopped breathing and felt my stomach muscles tighten. I was a tightly wound spring of fury, ready to snap. I could handle any one of them easily, but all at once would be challenging. I didn't care. I began advancing towards them when a large hand grabbed my shoulder. Josh Hamilton, the dock supervisor, gave me a silent nod towards the main office. I glared at the group with a hatred they hadn't seen before and followed Josh up the stairs. The laughter abruptly ceased, and concern flickered across their faces. Josh led me into Henry Clark's office, where I sat across from Henry's secretary, Sally Grady. Would you like some coffee? she asked. No, thanks. I'm too upset to hold a cup. I watched Josh and Henry talking through the glass partition, their conversation serious. Sally, were you at the party on Saturday night? I inquired. She nodded in response. Can you tell me what happened? I have no idea what's going on. I shouldn't say anything, Sally said. It's something you need to discuss with your wife. You were there, Sally. You saw what happened. Just give me a hint. Sally fumbled with some papers on her desk, trying to figure out how to dodge the conversation with me. Please, Sally, I need to know. Peggy showed up at the party dressed to kill. About an hour later, Colin started pouring drinks into her. She seemed to be having a good time. Colin whispered to his company every time they refilled her drinks, and they all laughed. An hour later, Bob Ray and Freddy came out. We didn't see any of them for an hour, and then they all reappeared, laughing and joking. Peggy was smiling but looked terrible, her hair and dress were disheveled. They left together about ten minutes later. Thank you, Sally. I didn't want to hear that, but it explains a lot. We sat in silence for another ten minutes. Josh came out and nodded for me to come in. Grady, I'm not thrilled about what happened this morning. Colin, Ray, 
Bob, and Freddie have been given a week off without pay. I want you to take a two-week leave, Josh told me. I assume this was the first you heard of it. I can't have someone ending up in the hospital. I don't believe it's your fault, but I hope you get things sorted out before you return. I'll do everything I can to help you get through this. Just ask. Now get out of here. I nodded in thanks to Henry and again to Sally as I left the office. Colin and his guys were nowhere to be seen. As I headed to the parking lot, I left the tank top on the dock. I didn't go home, I drove north in search of a haven where I could get lost. I had plenty of time to think about the past and the present. Peggy and I went to high school together. She was large, overweight, sloppy, and not what you'd call attractive. She didn't know how to take care of herself or apply makeup. Her hair always looked bad. She wasn't part of any in-group and was essentially a social outcast. Of course, that's what attracted me to her. I was 6 feet 3 inches and weighed about 310 pounds. I was big but, at the same time, awkward, shy, and not much to look at. I was too clumsy to play any sports. Colin Farrell was the complete opposite, good-looking, smooth-talking, and athletic. I know it sounds silly, but there were rumors that girls tried to get Colin to ask them out. He never had a steady girlfriend, but he never left without a date. I hated the guy. He bragged about his conquests, and the girls seemed to not mind, everyone but Peggy. Peggy tried to get Colin to ask her out. She wanted to be able to say he was her first. Colin not only refused her but told the whole school about it. The guys at school thought it was a joke, but Peggy was devastated. I saw it as my chance to approach her. Since I had no idea how to court a girl, I just started being friendly. Soon enough, we became close, and by the time we graduated, we were a couple. It was me who got to be her first. After high school, I got a job as a laborer on a construction site. Over a few years, my flabbiness disappeared, and I turned into all muscle and tendons. I was strong and coordinated. It was nice to stop being a walking joke. Peggy and I got married a year later. Robert and Dave were born very close to each other, and soon after that, Peggy started working out at a gym nearby. The transformation was astonishing. Somewhere along the way, she learned how to do her hair, apply just the right amount of makeup, and dress stunningly. She looked good, and I was proud. She was my wife. I loved her when she was a frog, and my reward was a princess. When I got the job on the loading dock, our lives changed for the better. Up until today, I kept reducing the miles. I knew where I was going, and it was just a matter of time. I thought about my two sons. They came from a large, strong lineage and showed it. We made sure they both stayed active so they didn't turn into lumps like us. Dave was about two inches taller than Robert and a bit slimmer. Robert had big hands. They both were in good shape and could take care of themselves. We taught them restraint and how important it was not to be bullies. They both had the same goal, to get to the sea. I guess it was in their blood. I promised to help them in whatever they wanted to do. Peggy was a good mother and a wonderful wife. She kept a good home and didn't waste money on frivolous things. We had a great love life, at least I thought so. It was fun when we made love, and I was completely satisfied with that part of our life. I found myself on the M6, still counting the miles. The shadows were getting longer, and I hoped to arrive before dark. It was a seven-hour drive to Port Patrick, but it was the only place I wanted to be right now. I kept looking for the 75 and finally found it. As the sun set, I handed the keys to the bartender and asked to book a room for a week. I had no luggage, no change of clothes, no razor, but I didn't care. He took the room key off the hook, handed it to me, and hung my car keys in the same place. I grabbed a bottle of beer and sat in the far corner. The street light shone through the amber bottle glass above my head. It was time to numb myself and forget about everything in the world. I discovered I woke up in my room late in the morning. I vaguely remembered how I got there. Usually, one of the local regulars helped me up the stairs and laid me on the bed. I never got under the sheets. 
I splashed some water on my face and took a couple of showers. I had to put on the same clothes again, so the shower didn't help much considering the smell. A fierce-looking beard started to grow. I never let facial hair grow, and it was a bit unsettling to see it in the state I was in. Every couple of days, they checked my credit card to keep the bill updated. I wallowed in self-pity for a long time, and it was starting to wear on me. I sat with glazed eyes, staring at the dartboard for the thousandth time, when two officers in uniform walked in. I watched them without looking directly at them. They talked a bit with the bartender, who nodded in my direction. He also pointed to my keys on the wall behind him. I assumed they were looking for me. I was amazed at my own astuteness. They didn't even try to talk to me for the next two hours, they just poured coffee into me. Grady, Grady Baxter, do you think you can talk to us? Did I do something wrong? We just need to talk. Are you ready? Can we go outside? The sun was shining, but everything was wet. The cobblestones on the street in front of the pub were slippery, and I wasn't in a hurry to cross over to the embankment. The whole street sloped downward, and I still felt a bit tipsy. The cool air wonderfully filled my lungs. I don't smoke, but the air inside was so thick that the result was the same. I bent over the granite sea wall, and it all came out. It was mostly liquid since I hadn't eaten much solid food in the last few days. My head started to clear, as did my vision. My two companions patiently waited for me to recover. I was starting to feel indebted for the trouble I'd caused them. The bench I sat on was wet, but I didn't care. How can I help you, gentlemen? First, we've been trying to find you since you've been missing for ten days. Secondly, we're trying to find Colin Farrell and hoped you could help us. Well, you found me, so that part is solved. I haven't seen Colin Farrell since the day I came here. I suppose the bartender already told you I haven't left the hotel since I checked in. I have no idea where Colin is, but I guess I'll look for him when I get back home. I chatted with them for about another hour. They had nothing to charge me with, and after they were sure I was safe, they seemed only interested in talking about Colin. They found me because charges were made to my credit card. I'll remember not to make that mistake again if it ever happens again. I walked down the hill and bought fresh clothes and a toothbrush. I decided to leave the beard for a while, although I thought it looked bad. After taking one last shower, I paid the bill and headed home. I stopped about four times on the way. Twice I managed to eat something, but mostly I just tried to delay my arrival. Nothing pleasant awaited me at home. Although I wanted to see my boys, she was sitting on the sofa. Only one light was on in the living room. She looked at me with her arms folded on her knees, afraid to move. It seemed like she had been crying, but it was hard to be sure in the dim light. I sat in the chair opposite her and waited for her to say something. The boys stayed at friends overnight. It was my idea so we could have some free time to talk. Why didn't you tell me about it before I found out? I don't know. I guess I was scared. Scared of what? I wasn't sure what you would think or do. I did something stupid, and it backfired. Backfired? What backfired? You won't be mad at me, right, Grady? I don't know. It would probably be better if you told the truth, but we'll have to wait and see. Grady, do you remember what Colin did to me in high school? Yes. I've wanted to get back at him for that ever since it happened. Saturday night at the party seemed like the right time, so I set a trap for him. That doesn't sound like the story I heard. Listen to me, Grady. As I said, it backfired on me. I dressed up really nice, and Colin started hitting on me. I let him think it was working, and he suggested we go back to the storeroom. We kissed a bit because I had to do that to lure him in. I took off my dress and waved it in front of his nose to make sure he was ready. Why would you do that? What were you thinking? I wanted to get back at him. I wanted to make him pay for humiliating me. Anyway, I noticed he was ready, so I told him to take his pants off so we could have some fun. He dropped his pants, and then I did something no girl should ever do. Okay, what did you do? 
I pointed at his thing and started laughing. I told him it was pathetic and that I would never let any man with such small equipment take me. As I teased him about his manhood, it began to shrink until there was nothing left but a limp thing. It was cruel but fitting in this case. Continue. I gathered myself and opened the door to leave. Bob, Ree, and Freddie were waiting outside the door. Obviously, Colin had told them they would have a few seconds after he was done with me, and they patiently waited their turn. I walked past them, laughing, and headed to the ladies' room. When I came back to the party, they were all standing around with wide grins on their faces. Obviously, they had told all the other guys at the party they had been with me in the storeroom. They said that to get back at me for humiliating Colin. I was upset and left. I heard you left with Colin. That's not true. I left alone and went straight home. Did you leave your clothes there for Colin? No, I just forgot them when I left. Why didn't you tell me after everything was turned around? I was scared. I didn't know what to say to you. So you let me figure it out on my own in front of all my workmates? I felt like a fool. They were teasing me about what happened, and I couldn't even respond because I knew nothing. I had to find out from the secretary what happened, and her story doesn't quite match yours. She wasn't there. I was. I told you what happened. Grady, I'm your wife. You're supposed to stand up for me and support me. Peggy cried and went to the kitchen. I sat with my soda, watching as she leaned on the plastic table and quietly cried. I loved her more than anything in the world. She was the only girl I ever cared about. She was feeding me all sorts of nonsense and fixing the plumbing. Peggy had plans to keep her marriage, Sally had no reason to lie to me. I felt the urge to question Peggy about every discrepancy in her story but decided not to. I couldn't change what happened, and forcing Peggy to confess to something she didn't want to wouldn't achieve anything. I really wanted to know the truth, but I wasn't going to get it out of her. I decided to leave things as they were and let her relax. I took another shower and climbed into bed with my wife. She laid her head on my shoulder, whispered that she loved me, and we both fell asleep. I still had a few days left before it was time to return to work. The boys were happy to see me but kept a bit of distance. I suggested a trip to London, which was quickly accepted. Peggy seemed happy that the men and her family were bonding. On the way to London, I learned that both boys had been suspended from school for fighting, which was strictly forbidden in our family. Reluctantly, they explained that they were greatly upset by their mother's stunt at the party and eventually decided to put an end to it. A few boys with talkative mouths ended up with knocked out teeth and black eyes. They had the suspension from their mother but asked me for explanations about the party. I put it off. We went to the Maritime and Coast Guard Agency, where I requested three applications, and the boys were thrilled. Filling out all the forms took an hour. I had all the necessary documents, including birth certificates and passports. After each of us went through a brief interview, we were given medical forms to be filled out by a doctor. We had dinner at Wagamama and headed home. It was decided that nothing would be mentioned to their mother or friends. The medical examination was completed the next day, and all that was left for us to do was wait. I've always loved Peggy, she was the only girl I've ever loved, the only girl I've ever made love to. In fact, she was the only girl I've ever kissed. It was hard to believe she could stoop so low. I found her actions cowardly and unforgivable. I was still willing to give her a chance if there was any way her story could be proven, but the odds were slim. By the end of that week, she had hammered the final nail into our marriage. Peggy was very attentive. She tried never to mention the party or give any hints about it. She never discussed my trip to Port Patrick. She did everything in her power to get our life back to what it was. That night, she was very loving in bed. The next morning at breakfast, I was struck by the incredible stupidity of her comment. Grady, I've been thinking, I would like to have another child. Now I knew what last night's lovemaking session was about. You need a little background information to appreciate the stupidity of this comment. Peggy had been on medication for several years after the boys were born. 
about three years ago, she started complaining about side effects. I won't go into details, but she had various female issues that were supposedly caused or exacerbated by the medication. In any case, she decided to stop taking them. We did not use any other form of birth control. Sometime later, I was in the doctor's office for a male health issue, and within 20 minutes, I was sterilized. I never mentioned it to Peggy and saw no need to. For the last three years, Peggy and I had made love without protection. Peggy never mentioned or wondered why she wasn't getting pregnant. Now she suddenly wanted to wave a magic wand and have a child. Either she was incredibly stupid, or she thought I was incredibly stupid. I looked at her in amazement. I think that would be great, darling. As a man, I know little about pregnancy, but since it's been almost three weeks since the party, there's a good chance Peggy was covering herself up. This shed a completely new light on things, so I decided to change my schedule. The boys went back to school, and I had a chance to talk to them a bit before they left. They seemed to understand my situation with their mother better than I did. I felt better knowing I had their support, whatever happened. I wasn't sure what would happen at that moment. I spent most of the day looking for Colin Farrell. He had to be somewhere. During my lunch break, I went to the docks and talked to Sally. Bob Ray and Freddy had returned to work, but she had no idea what was happening with Colin. Rumors were that he was scared I would come after him. It made no sense because I was a peaceful guy. I avoided the work area to avoid running into any of the three adversaries that day. I stopped by a local lawyer and started the paperwork necessary for a divorce from Peggy. I didn't want to cause her pain, but I no longer wanted to live with her. The boys would soon be on their own, and I saw no reason to stay. The only remaining issue I couldn't get rid of was the need to thank Colin and his boys for breaking up my marriage. I know Peggy was primarily to blame, but I couldn't punish her. Her lovers would have to pay for their short-sightedness. Freddie Springer was married but always stopped by McMurray's to have a bottle of beer before heading home. It was getting dark when he stepped out the side door and walked along the building to his car parked in the back. I surprised him by grabbing his left arm and twisting it behind his back. I slammed him into the wall at full speed. His knees buckled slightly, but I held onto his arm and started punching with my right fist. As he dropped lower, my fist hit higher. I must have hit him about twenty times when his arm went limp in the shoulder socket. I dropped him when a group of people came down the alley. No one chased after me as I calmly walked to my car and drove away. Two hours later, I was sitting in the police station. Peggy had just listed the house for sale to get Bill money and was finishing the paperwork. Alice Springer stormed in, screaming that she wanted me locked up forever. They managed to keep her away from me, but she didn't stop until Peggy talked to her. I don't know what Peggy said but Alice looked at both of us and left. Robert and Dave took my car and drove me home, with Peggy following them. The boys seemed proud of me, but I was cautious and didn't say or do anything that might encourage them. Freddy had a dislocated shoulder, a broken nose, two black eyes, and several internal injuries that hadn't been fully identified yet. My wife and I didn't talk about the problem when we got home. For the first time in twenty years, I slept on the couch, but I didn't mind. The next morning, I got up early, trying to figure out what to do next. A ship was unloading in Felixstowe, the captain, Josie Costa, was a pleasant man and was willing to take me on board when and if I got my papers. I promised to call him back later in the week. On the way home, I stopped to fill up the gas tank. Just as I finished, I noticed someone rushing towards me. I turned around just as Ray Collins hit me on the left side with a two-by-four. The wood bounced off my left arm before breaking a couple of ribs. I winced and doubled over in pain. I remember trying to breathe but couldn't. With my eyes closed, I saw bright white flashes, then felt my knees buckle. The wooden club made a funny clattering sound, bouncing on the asphalt. Ray couldn't hold on to it after the hit. My right hand shot forward as I fell grabbing some flannel. I managed to turn left as I hit the ground with my right fist. Flannel and all, I felt I landed hard on Ray. My eyes were still squeezed shut, trying to suppress the pain on my left side. 
I couldn't move my left arm. I acted on instinct as my right hand began to pound up and down. I didn't know what I was hitting, but as long as it wasn't the asphalt, it was fine. Both sides of my body were operating independently. While my left side curled up, seeking protection, my right attacked anything it could find. At first, Ray writhed beneath me, trying to get free, but after a few seconds, he was still. I didn't stop hitting him until some customers pulled me away. I still couldn't breathe properly, and it hurt. One of the paramedics gave me an injection, and I slept the entire way to the hospital. I woke up a few hours later with a bandage on my left arm and my body tightly wrapped. I could breathe, but only with caution. Peggy was there and did not look pleased. Grady, what do you think you're doing making a fuss over this little party incident? Sorry, darling, I didn't do anything. Why did your boyfriend attack me with a club? And what do you mean by a little party incident? Either I get a better explanation of what happened that Saturday, or I'll continue talking to people. You're not talking, you're stalking them and beating them up. I smiled broadly at her. Why would I want to do something like that? Stop acting like a thug and stop calling them my boyfriends. Peggy left the room just as the doctor came in. I was more bruised than broken. Ray swung that wood like a little boy. My arm just hurt, and the cracks in my ribs were superficial. The pain and breathing issues were just from the fall. Early the next morning, Robert and Dave came and picked me up. They were grinning from ear to ear, and I told them to stop it. Ray, on the other hand, was in bad shape. He would be eating through a straw for about a month until his jaw healed, and it would be at least a week before the swelling in his face went down. A stray hit had also broken his left collarbone. Of course, all the hits were stray because at that moment, I had no idea what I was hitting. No charges were brought against me because several people testified that Ray attacked me first. I had to call work and take another week off, this time due to illness. I talked a bit with Sally, and she told me that Bob Timbers had quit his job and his last paycheck was sent to his brother's house in Aberdeen. They still had no idea where Colin was. Communication with Peggy was not great now. I slept on the couch every night. I was able to remove the bandage from my arm quite quickly, but my ribs still ached a bit. At least I could move and breathe normally. The ship was sailing in four days. I stopped by to see my lawyer. The divorce papers were ready, so I told him to file them in four days. I was leaving everything to Peggy. She would get the house, but the bail company would take it if I didn't post bail. It didn't matter to me. I made a few phone calls to friends in Scotland and spent some time in the gym, trying to recover from the club's aftermath. Henry Clark was not happy about my departure but agreed to keep my leaving a secret for as long as he could. I asked him to look after my boys if necessary. Peggy stopped going to the gym, and the house was in chaos. Laundry was piling up, and the overall state of the place was deteriorating. Meals were hastily prepared, and conversation was not very lively. I swear it looked like she had gained weight again. The whole world went to oblivion in four weeks. The next day, the boys handed me my set of maritime documents. I had never seen them so happy. All three of us were ready to go. I told them to wait and finish the school year before making any decisions. I don't think they were listening to me. I returned on board and took care of everything I had to do. The quartermaster gave me a list of items to bring before departing the next morning. I packed my gear, checked into my cabin on board, and then left the ship for the last time. Robert would pick up the motorcycle later. My first shift was that night, so I spent the rest of the day resting after the ride. That motorcycle had thrown me for a loop. I woke up a few hours later, took a shower, and had dinner. My supervisor gave me my job description, explained my duties, and left me alone. It was entry-level work and wasn't too difficult or overwhelming. My crewmates were less than friendly and not very helpful. They answered any direct questions I had but offered no assistance or advice, and none of them seemed interested in forming any kind of association. I was looking forward to some connection with the rest of the team, but it seemed it would be difficult. They all seemed to be friendly with each other, 
but I was not included in their circle. I decided to wait it out. By now, Peggy knew I had left. The divorce papers were to be served to her that morning. I'm sure Bob Timbers had already told his entire story to the police. I could imagine my two sons giggling with each other about the current events. My shift ended, and I went to sleep. Two days later, I was called to the captain's cabin in the middle of the day. Captain Costa did not look happy as I stood before him. Mr. Baxter, the Royal Navy has requested permission to land a helicopter on board to take you back to the mainland. This morning, I received an extensive telegram explaining their request. I will summarize some of the extradition points. If there are any inaccuracies, you may clarify them. I simply nodded in agreement. They want to speak with you regarding the disappearance of a man named Colin Farrell. You face charges for assaulting Fred Springer and have been denied bail for this offense. Additionally, you are charged with causing injuries to Ray Collins. What were initially deemed self-defense have now been reclassified due to their severity. Furthermore, on the night you boarded the ship, you reportedly assaulted Bob Timber. It's unclear how you could be in both places simultaneously, and I don't intend to find out. The records suggest you may have committed these acts as retaliation for a personal slight. Any comments, Mr. Baxter? Sir, I apologize for any trouble I may have caused, I answered. I meant regarding the charges, he specified. Only this, if I could find Colin Farrell, he'd be in the hospital alongside the others. I genuinely don't know where he is. I'll gather my belongings and prepare for the helicopter. Captain Costa merely looked at me and smiled. There's no need for that. I've informed them that you never boarded. There's no Grady Baxter on this ship. Now, return to your duties. I went back to the crew quarters, showered, and readied myself for my shift. By the time dinner was over, the police report had circulated among the crew. By the end of the voyage, I had more friends than I could handle. I didn't reach out to anyone back home until we'd been at sea for about a month. Then, I received a telegram from my lawyer, the divorce was finalized, and I was now a free man. Peggy had handed over the house to the bail company when I left the country. Colin Farrell had ended up in the hospital with severe internal injuries. The police were searching for Robert and Dave in connection with the assault. My sons had found Colin with Peggy in her bedroom before the house was returned. Peggy was now living in a hostel with her sister, pregnant, and struggling with her weight issues again. I was still not charged, and my lawyer advised against returning. He had no information on the whereabouts of my sons. The news left me with mixed emotions. The next morning at breakfast, the captain stopped by my table. I wanted to let you know that Robert and Dave Baxter are not on the ship heading to Cape Town. We exchanged smiles. I had always dreamed of being a sailor.